introduce our speaker. As I said, Jeffrey McCullough is an assistant director for is assistant director for special collections and the university archivist at Furman University Libraries. He has written on nineteenth century American literature and book history in the papers of the Bibliographical Society of America Literature and History, Printing History, and the Oxford Companion to the Book. He is the co-editor of In Dogs We Trust, an anthology of American dog literature, recently published by the University of South Carolina Press. And then his book, Print on Demand, Stereotyping and Electrotyping in the United States Printing Trades and Publishing Industry, 1810 to 1876, will be published next year by the Pennsylvania State University Press. He teaches um, a class at OLLI each fall, including this fall, on the history of books and printing, and it's a very popular course, and we are thrilled to have Jeff with us this evening, so I'll hand it over to you. Thank you, Nancy. Welcome, everybody. It's great to have you out here and joining in on a Friday afternoon on a kind of gloomy day. We can lighten the mood a little bit with cocktails and some Venetian printing. Um, I'd just like to thank Nancy and Jessica and her staff at OLLI for their ever-present helpfulness and, and kindness and willingness to take an idea and run with it. Um, this has been a lot of fun and it's going to be a lot of fun. So keep joining in with us Friday afternoons at five for the next five weeks where we're going to have more curators and academics and librarians talking from the upstate uh, about significant items in their collections. So today we're gonna to be in, in, in Venice in Northern Italy uh, at the turn of the 16th century. And we're going to look at the printing output of a man named Aldous Manutius and the way he revolutionized certain aspects of the printing trades. And so since we're going to be in Italy at this time and it's still sort of warm out, I thought the perfect aperitivo to have is a Negroni. And I have mine here with me. And I'm going to say cheers, friends, to you. OK. Let's get started. I'm going to share my screen. So this is a uh, 1580s map of Venice, a little bit later than the period we're talking about, but it's, it gives us a good representation of where, where we're we're looking and where we're going to be talking about. So, um, you know, printing starts in, Ger in southern Germany in the 1450s, and within a generation, these German printers branch out over Europe uh, and uh, take the, their trade to major cities and smaller cities, and within 25 years, uh, 30 years or so, every major city in Europe has a print shop and a printing press. Uh, so too with Italy. Uh, the first printers came down from Germany uh, to a, a monastery outside of Rome in the, in the 1460s. Rome uh, was printing in the late 1460s and Venice in the very early 1470s. Um, Venice at this period of time, of course, was the center of Adriatic trade, but also really a center of world trade centered in the Mediterranean. Um, Constantinople fell to the Ottoman Empire in 1453, and so the Holy Roman Empire and all of Eastern Christendom sort of was rocked by this, and that is going to have some serious consequences for the types of uh, materials that are coming into print at this time. There's a huge outflux of Christians from Constantinople. And where do they end up? Well, in, in large part, they, they pass through Venice, or they end up in Venice. Venice is a cosmopolitan trading port that extends out its influence into the Black Sea, into, into the Eastern Mediterranean, of course, and also into in as far as, as Asia and North Africa. It's a center of commerce and trade and intellectual activity, even though it doesn't have a university of its own. The printers at this point are tradesmen for the most part. They're not academics, they're not scholars. They're uh, goldsmiths and jewelers and scribes and people who are artisans and craftsmen. 
combining all these processes together, ink and paper and type founding and presses to, to make printed materials with one exception, and that's the gentleman we're going to talk about today, Aldus Manutius, or Aldo Manutio, if you will. Here's two engravings of him that are contemporaries, born in 1449 and dies in 1515, significant for the book we're going to look at today. Uh, born in northern Italy to a, a fairly wealthy family, he becomes a scholar of, of Latin and Greek, uh, a fellow student of the great Italian philosopher of the Renaissance, Pico della Mirandola. And because of that, he ends up as the tutor to two princes in a northern Italy state. Uh, they end up, uh, after they grow up and come into their inheritance, end up funding him. And so at the age of 40, he leaves Rome and Brescia and a couple other cities he lives in and moves to Venice and founds a print shop capital with capital from these two princes who, whom he tutored and, and, grew, and saw grow up. Uh, because of that background, the output of Aldous's press is different from all the other European presses at this point. He's a scholar, he's a textual critic, and he's especially interested in Greek texts at a point in time when they are neglected by most everyone else. Uh, Latin scholarship, ecclesiastical works, of course, are coming out of the printing presses, legal documents, but the Greek classics, the ancient Greek writers that existed in manuscript are, are pretty much overlooked up to this point. Aldous changes that. And so within 1493, when he establishes his first um, output of the press a couple years after settling in Venice, he brings out the Editio Princeps, the first printed edition in its original language of Greek authors such as Theocritus, Hesiod, Aristotle, uh, in a massive five volume set from 1495 to 1498. He brings out the first edition of Aristophanes, Thucydides, Herodotus, Sophocles, and in 1513 he brings out the collected works of Plato and the Greek printed for the first time. Um, he, has, he has Greek scholars working for him to help correct the texts and typographers who are making Greek printing types uh, for him. He's bringing out big editions, big size folio editions, massive works, scholarly works, coffee table books, if you will, but really um, university library and uh, you know, ecclesiastical library texts of these, of these works. And then something changes around 1500, 1501, and we'll get there in a minute. Um, amazingly enough, the palazzo that Aldous lived in still exists and stands uh, in Venice. It's sort of, um, the, it's the, the neighborhood is, is San Augustine, and it's about halfway between St. Mark's Square and the, uh, the train station today. So not, not, a, not a 10, 15 minute walk, bas basically, uh, from, from St. Mark's Square, not very far. There's a plaque on the top of the, um, uh, of the second story of the building, and uh, Aldo Pio Manuzio, and you can see here in Italian, um, the translation is, uh, where the light of Greek letters return to shine upon civilized people. <laughs> so um, one of the consequences of the fall of Constantinople, the Eastern Orthodoxy, Byzantium, is that a, a tremendous amount of gr ancient Greek manuscripts came with this Christian diaspora that fled Constantinople and moved over into the Western Mediterranean and Adriatic. And so Venice was the prime place for Aldous to be able to find Greek manuscripts of these authors, compare them, find the proper editions, uh, make his notes, and be able to bring out the best editions that he could, the most authoritative editions. So that, that's his, if he's known for nothing else, he's known for this revival of, of ancient Greek texts and flooding a, schol a new uh, scholarly, creating basically a new scholarly market in these things. But that's not his only innovation. Um, in 1501, he creates a new series of books. Uh, prior to this, books are, for the most part, are big. 
they're large folio things, the things you carry under your arm and not in your pocket. Um, but he decides to, to upend things and he creates smaller editions, octavo editions of Greek and Latin authors. Um, and instead of printing them in an edition of 150 to 250 copies, which was the norm for edition sizes at this period, he goes to a thousand copies. And, he's, and because the size is small and compact, uh, there's no additional commentary or introductory material or notes or things. It's just the text itself. He's able to sell them for a relatively cheaper price, pocket classics. And so that's what we're going to look at today. Aldous, at, at this time also, creates a printer's mark for himself. Printers had their, their own uh, sigils, to use a Game of Thrones reference, right? Uh, their own marks that, that denoted their, their brand. And because of his interest in classical learning, he took a coin from the Emperor Titus from AD 80, uh, and the, the reverse of it had a dolphin and an anchor and took a motto, Festina Lente, make haste slowly. The dolphin and anchor symbolize strength and speed. And so what you're looking at on the right-hand side is the printer's mark that he then starts to use on his subsequent editions, uh, branding his, his output, and also making this direct connection between him and the ancient world of Rome and also of ancient Greece. Aldous, by the way, if you grew up in the 80s and did some graphic design, uh, lent himself to PageMaker software, uh, which has now been acquired by Adobe. It was the sort of uh, standard, the gold standard in 1986 for doing a digital page, page layout. And Aldous Brewing Company and other things exist. So yeah, his, his, his influence is well known. Uh, but what he also did was employ a typographer named Francesco Griffo. I'm going to go and I'm going to share something else here. He employed a typographer named Francesco Griffo to create a smaller script for these new pocket classics, something that used a Roman typeface as he'd been using, uh, but also to condense it, to save space on the page and to shrink his page size down what we now think of as, and know as, italic typeface. He created this in 1501. Now, I'm going to share another screen here, and we're going to go live. Okay, so here's the book in question. It's an edition of Lucan's Pharsalia, uh, printed by Aldus in Venice. In this case, this is 1515, so about uh, 13 years after he's printing the first pocket classics. I'm live on the webcam. Here's my hand, and here's the book. You can see it's printed, uh, it's bound in a, in a thin vellum binding, and it's right about the size of my palm. Or, as someone in the class I taught last year very smartly pointed out, it is almost the exact size as my iPhone 8 Plus. <laughs> So Johnny Ive at Apple designing books, uh, digital devices that you can work in the palm of your hand had nothing on Aldus Manutius in Venice at the turn of the 16th century. You see on the spine here, Lucan, Aldus, 1515. Roman poet Lucas, uh, Lucan was, was active about AD 60 in the reign of Nero. He was a friend of Nero's and later uh, was involved in a plot against him and was forced to commit suicide at the age of 25 or 26. The Pharsalia is his big epic work. It's a, a long epic poem about civil war that took place um, uh, between Julius Caesar and Pompey. So the first great civil war between the, uh, the, the emperor and the senate. And here, here you go. I'm gonna zoom in. Lucanus here in a Roman typeface. This is all we get for a title page in 1515. Not all works have conventional title pages. And you can also see along here, the text block, the outer edge of the text block, someone has gone in an ink and put in Lucanus or Lucan right here. Oftentimes books at this period were stored flat on a shelf 
with the text block facing out rather than upright on a bookshelf. And after the proto title page, here's the text. It starts Marcus Aeneas Lucanus, Civilis Belli, the Civil War, uh, known in, in also in uh, as just the Pharsalia after the big battle, one of the big battles in the Civil War, Liber Primus. At Roman typeface, and here the work starts. And here is Aldus's italic. There's a large open space here with the B, Bella, where a, the printer thought that perhaps following manuscript tradition, uh, someone would go in an illuminator in red or blue and decorate a large initial B here for this work. But this isn't a fancy work. This is, this is a text that is made for a growing mercantile class, an educated university trained doctor, lawyer, merchant, aristocrat in Venice and in Northern Italy who could afford to buy these things and hold them and read them by the fire or put them in their pockets and carry them around with them. So it's not a fancy edition, uh, but it's artfully designed and it does have a little bit of pretensions here. The previous owner didn't go in and hire an illuminator to go in and, and make any fancy emendations to it. And this would go right into the text. You can see the first line, uh, the first letter of each line of poetry has a Roman letter on it. And then we go right into italics here. Uh, you can see also that the type has to make sense. You have overlapping letters that have to fit where the Roman Q and the italic U have to exist here. And so it, it takes a little bit of skill to, to get the typography right, where these different letter forms, these different fonts can happen at the same time. And so this is what you get in this tiny pocket edition, all 10 books. Uh, Luca, the, the work stops about halfway through the story of the Civil War because Lucan had to commit suicide uh, and book 10 uh, just ends abruptly. And we are, how far in are we? We're 130 some pages in. So you see, it's not a large book. Actually, this is, these are 136 uh, leaves. The book isn't paginated with each, with each page number, each leaf is paginated, as you can see here. We go from 136 to 137. And the work just simply ends. For Sale Lucanus Finis, it ends. And there's some other things here, a little bit of additional information at the back. And here is our colophon, uh, the the, the matter that will eventually make its way up to the title page. Uh, Venetus, in Edibus Aldi, at Andrea Soseri, who is his partner in the business, month of July, 1515. Aldus dies in February of 1515, and uh, his business partner runs the business with his um, nephew, who's only about 11 years old at that time as the sort of presumptive heir. And he inherits it. And then his son, Aldus Minucius, the, the, the junior, uh, inherits it from him. And Aldus's print shop uh, publishing business continues until 1590 uh, in Venice, in relatively in the same space. So he, he establishes a hundred year uh, legacy over three successive generations of work. And then at the end, you have the dolphin and anchor. All told, uh, uh, Aldous brought out about um, 45 different uh, editions of these pocket classics. This is actually the second Lucan's Pharsalia he published. Uh, the first one was done in 1502. It was a popular text. Uh, because it was relatively short in size, the line lengths were, were, were fairly brief. Um, it was a good text for beginning Latin scholars uh, in schools and also to learn Roman history. And so unsurprisingly, um, most of the editions prior to this that existed uh, were published in Italy, in Rome, in Venice, Milan, Verona. Actually, before 1500, there were at least 18 separate editions of Lucan's Pharsalia brought out there, but all in large size folio works. 
It was Aldus in 1502, and then the reprint here in 1515 that shrunk it down to size, brought the price down, and increased the press run to bring it out to a wider audience. So we have that, we have Aldus to thank for that. My friends, it's 522. Um, there's the work. Uh, this has been in the Furman Library's collection for about four years now. Um, Aldines are out there and they are wonderful things and people with uh, deep pockets and investment banking backgrounds collect them. Uh, Furman has, a, has, this is our only one. We have a couple of leaves of his other works, but this, this gets us there and this gets us where we need to look at. Uh, Aldous's uh, home and print shop was right up about here. So here's St. Here's St. Mark's and the train station where you come off the main line is right about here and the causeway is kind of up here. So Aldous's home neighborhood is right in here, uh, not in San Marco, but a little, little bit up here about halfway between the two. All right, I'll stop. Uh, thank you for your time and attention. I'll go back to me. And if there are questions, I'd be happy to answer them or attempt an answer, or at least maybe to try to contextualize a little bit more. Thank you for your time and attention. That was, that was great, Jeff. I do have some questions that have come in the chat. Oh. Um, let's see, I'll just go in order here. Um, some, Don Lineback asked what the wording was written just inside the cover, like an inscription, maybe somebody had written. Oh, um, uh, yes, yes. Um, some, a previous owner, and this is probably hmm, 17th, 18th century hand. I'm looking it up here. It says, I can get this right, Libro Rero. <laughs> so <laughs> this is a rare book. Uh, okay. uh, and the rest of it I can't uh, translate on the fly, I'm afraid. It's, it's Italian. Um, pro cog no, I'm not going to attempt it. <laughs> so I'll stop on it. We have an Italian class going on, so we'll have some experts soon. Oh, maybe good. I can get you a scan and you can work on it. <laughs> Thank you. Um, okay, the next question, why did he use the italic and did he invent it? Uh, he did invent it. He, he directed his typographer, his punch cutter, to create a condensed script. So something where he could get a maximum amount of words in a shortened amount period of space. So it wasn't meant to be like today, you know, your italic is an option, uh, just as your bold is an option on, on Microsoft Word of the same sort of typeface family. And you kind of do that for, you make it a, a word italic for emphasis or to highlight a book title or something. Uh, in this case, it was a complete separate script, Roman script, but just made in a slant in a way to condense a line. So in, in other words, paper costs at this period of time would have been 60 to 70% of the cost of an actual bringing out a work. So it was an, it was an amount of uh, upfront costs that the printer or publisher had to front and hopefully as the edition sells, get, recoup that cost over time. So getting a small edition and getting the page size down to maximize a large sheet of paper and the space on there where the text is, was uh, a primary concern to make these, these tiny little works uh, work basically as commercial products. So it was completely uh, not an aesthetic uh, decision, but a uh, typographical exercise in a publisher doing cost setting measures to shrink it down by, you know, a quarter and be able to condense that down. Uh, he also did it for Greek uh, uh, types, which is also interesting. And people complain that his Greek typefaces in italic for these pocket classics aren't nearly as legible as his regular classical Greek folios, his, his Odysseo Princeps of Aristotle, that's what have you. So. Okay, yeah. um, another question, is that, act, is that particular book actually 400 years old? And if so, what is it worth? And then related to that, someone else asked why you weren't wearing gloves while you handled it. <laughs> right. Yes, it's very much this. Uh, it is very much, this was printed in 1515, and under normal circumstances, we would have this in class, we would be working with it in class. I encourage all our students to take a very hands-on approach to having tactile encounters with rare books. Absolutely. Uh, and they are survivors. This is uh, printed on linen paper, flax, 
uh, rags, basically, and sails. Um, I tell our undergraduates, this is, this is, these are medieval underpants that went into making the paper that this work is printed on. And old rags get recycled and repurposed into paper. Uh, a vellum leather binding, but it is as crisp and as sharp and as legible as when it first came out. These, these early printed books are survivors, very much so. And they uh, can be handled safely and comfortable under curatorial privilege here, but in, in our reading room and in a classroom under good conditions. Um, nobody uses white gloves. It's an urban myth, uh, not in rare book libraries. We don't do it. That's, that's interesting. I didn't know that. Um, so what would the book have cost when it was first published and what would that particular volume be worth now? So they were, they were still expensive books. Aldous's large folio editions would have been many months salary for an individual. So they often went to, uh, to aristocratic clients, royal clients, uh, institutional clients who, who are buying these things. The pocket classics are a little bit different. Uh, there's the, the price of one of these I've, I've seen was, was, was 30 soldi, which is about a quarter of a ducat. In, 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 this, in this period of time. And a, um, a master craftsman would have made about 50 soldis a day. These sold for 30. So, um, you know, roughly a day's wages for a very skilled artisan uh, would, have, would have been the cost of this. So you, you extrapolate that out and say, oh, was it, you know, maybe two or three hundred dollars maybe uh, of our equivalent? So, you know, not a, not a spur of the moment decision, but certainly something that uh, learned individuals who had a little bit of disposable income could afford to buy. Uh, these days, the pocket classics are four-figure books, let's put it that way, depending on what it is, when it came out uh, in the run of Aldous's work, um, but it'll, it, it, they could run for anywhere from 2000 up to um, $10,000, basically. Um, someone else asked how there's interest in how Furman came to have that book? Was it donated? Do you know who gave it? Or is it anonymous? In this case, it's an acquisition. I bought it from a London dealer about four years ago okay. um, because of its place in printing history. Uh, we needed to have something here and to fill gaps along the way in place and time and press and types of, uh, types of works. So I'm continually adding to, the, uh, to our collections here uh, by gift, but also by, by purchase. So as a follow-up to that, someone asked, you know, do you have kind of a wish list of other rare books that you're looking for? <laughs> oh, yes, absolutely. Always. <laughs> um, absolutely. Anything else from the Aldine Press, I'd love to have. He, uh, he printed what, what's said to be the most beautiful book of the 15th century. It's a sort of dream novel by a, by a mad priest named Francesco Colonna, and it's called the Hypnoratomachia Polyphily. And it's a lavishly illustrated dream novel, mystical text. Um, it's an amazing thing. And, you know, <laughs> uh, if a copy comes up for sale and someone has a, a cool $500,000, I would be happy to add it to the collection. <laughs> but other things, of course, more modestly, yes, I'm constantly looking for things to supplement okay. the collection. Um, it is 530. Do you have time for two more questions? Yes, sure. Okay. Um, the first is, how or when did we start using italics as emphasis rather than just another type style? Yes, um, a little much later. Um, the emphasis is uh, probably in the 18th century, um, maybe late 17th century, and it depends on where we are in Europe or the Americas that this starts to get used. But um, things become, some sorts of works, at least in the, in the Anglophone world, become very typographically interesting in the 17th century and eight, in early 18th centuries. So people start to use a lot of italic typeface for emphasis in addition to regular Roman straight up typefaces uh, within a line or specific sections or even sentences offset a paragraph or something. And so it becomes the convention to use it for emphasis within a work that is normally just in straight ahead Roman typeface. Um, and different places, different times do it a little bit differently. But yeah, um, um, but really uh, you can find books in Italy printed in exclusively in Italic typeface um, well into the 17th century. Okay. And then one final question. I think this is a great one to end on. How did you get into this field? 
Um, well, at the time I got into librarianship because my interests were not contained by a single discipline. <laughs> Let's put it that way. Um, later on, I, I started to narrow down into, into American printing history. But, uh, but getting into this, I, uh, I started to become, I trained to become an archivist and I learned about the history of books and printing along the way. And I decided to run with it. And it turned actually out into a, into a career. And so now I, I have the joys of working with a great collection, but I also get to teach with it and introduce students to our materials and see them, the light bulbs go off when they get to handle these things and make connections between them. And so it's a great part of my job under normal conditions to bring people in and put old and rare materials into the hands of the young and impressionable. It's a great thing. And also into the hands of retirees at Ollie. <laughs> We're doing this online exclusively this semester in my class, and I can only replicate the sound and the feel of handling a medieval manuscript or a, uh, an early printed book, but we're trying our best. Well, we all look forward to getting back to those normal circumstances you refer to, but um, this event this afternoon has been a great um, substitute for some of the things that we do in person, and we are grateful to you for providing this um, delightful start to our weekend. And I'm so glad that um, I was able to be here and that we had such a great crowd. Um, Thank you for being here, everybody. Um, next week, Christina Hornback, who's the, who's the chief curator at the Upcountry History Museum, is gonna be here and she's gonna be talking about some miniature paintings in their collection. Yeah, we've got a great um, series ahead of us. So everybody enjoy, y'all have a great weekend and we'll see you soon. Thank you all.